He was seen as an ally, and he was an ally to fundamentalism. He was blasted as, as guilty by association by those who were the enemies of fundamentalism. He never would accept the term himself. Uh, here's Stonehouse's definition of fundamentalists. People who, quote, single out certain great facts and doctrines, the fundamentals, that had come under particular attack and were concerned then to emphasize their truth and defend them, end quote. Now, there's a lot more to it than that, and Machen didn't like it. Here's what he said. Do you suppose that I do regret being called by a term that I greatly dislike, a fundamentalist? I most certainly do regret it. But in the presence of a great common foe, I have little time to be attacking my brethren who stand with me in the defense of the word of God. So there you, there you hear the balance of yes and no to fundamentalism. Here's what he did not like about it. These were his characteristics. One, the absence of a historical perspective. Two, the lack of appreciation for scholarship. Three, the substitution of brief skeletal creeds for historic confessions. Four, the lack of concern for precise formulation of Christian doctrine. Five, pietistic perfectionistic tendencies. Let me just insert, just to give you a, a glimpse here, for somebody like me that grew up in a home that I would call fundamentalist and, and love it, prize it, cherish it, wouldn't choose any other home to grow it up in, never have joined the people at Fuller where I was, kicking against that prick and using nasty language and talking like an adolescent till you're 40 years old about how bad everything was in fundamentalism. I have no patience with that kind of debunking at all. But it took a while for me to get adjusted that there could be Christians who smoke. Listen to this, listen to this quote. 1905, he's just finishing up at Princeton. The fellows are in my room now on the last Sunday night, smoking the cigars and eating the oranges, which has been the greatest delight I have ever had to provide whenever possible. My idea of delight is a Princeton room full of fellows smoking. <laughs> When I, when I think what a wonderful aid tobacco is to friendship and Christian patience, I have sometimes regretted that I never began to smoke. I mean, I, I think I can read that now. I just, it just takes my breath away, my fundamentalist breath away, literally. And, and it's killing about 40 thousand people a year who don't smoke but go to work with those who do well enough on that <laughs> I, 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 I still believe in all those things six one-sided otherworldliness seven a penchant for futuristic gileism premillennialism he didn't like it he was an amillennialist so th those were the things that set him off from, from fundamentalism. He was on one side and they were on the other, but when it came to the modernists, they were like two peas in a pod as far as he was concerned. Now, there's a deeper issue for why he did not align himself with the fundamentalists, and this is important because this gets to the root of how he tackled modernism in his day. And I hope the definition of modernism will come out in, in a few minutes more clearly perhaps than it has been so far. He went deeper than the fundamentalists and he went broader than the fundamentalists and he owed his ability to do that to Benjamin Breckenridge Warfield. February 16, 1921, halfway through his time at Princeton, uh, Machen uh, I mean, uh, Warfield died. Machen wrote home to his mother, with all his glaring faults, he was the greatest man I ever knew. 1909, on the 400th anniversary of John Calvin's birth, Warfield gave a great address 
to the uh, faculty and uh, others gathered to celebrate that event on Calvinism. And it struck to the very depths of Mayton's mind and heart what Warfield said on that day. What he said in essence was that Calvinism is not a species of Christian theism alongside others. It is Christianity come to full flower. Quote, Calvinism is not a specific variety of theistic thought or religious experience or evangelical faith, but just the perfect manifestation of these things. The difference between it and other forms of theism, religion, evangelicalism, is the difference not of kind but of degree. It does not take its position then beside other types of things. It takes its place over all else and claims to be these things as embodying what they claim to be. Now this is a weighty, weighty distinction. Alongside of, as a species, alongside, or the, the full-blown flower of what other things are trying to become. Now Machen believed this. And this governed the way Machen thought about uh, Christianity and how it interacted with everything else out there. Lutheranism is its sister type of Protestantism. Arminianism it's, is its rebellious daughter. Calvinism's grasp of the supremacy of God in all of life enabled Machen to see that other forms of evangelicalism were all stages of grasping God, which were yet in process of coming to the full and pure appreciation of the total God-centeredness of Calvinism. Now what that meant for Machen was that his mission over against modernism was not to defend a species called fundamentalism, but to defend Christianity. When he defended the Calvinistic supernaturalism of his day, he did not see himself as in any corner of Christianity. It was Christianity. That was, that was what drove him. So his main problem with the term fundamentalist was this, quote, it seems to suggest that we are adherents of some strange new sect, whereas in point of fact, we are conscious simply of maintaining the historic Christian faith and of moving in the great central current of Christian life. That's what set him off most deeply from fundamentalism. He was invited to be the president of Bryan Memorial University, which now I think is just Bryan College in Dayton, Tennessee. And he wrote to turn it down. Now, that move from Princeton to Bryan would have been to a presidency. It no doubt would have been a different school than it is now had he done that. But it would have taken him out of the PCUSA. It would have put him in a more ecumenical, interdenominational, premillennial atmosphere. And he couldn't do it. And here's why. He wrote the letter of refusal like this. Thoroughly consistent Christianity to my mind, is found only in the Reformed or Calvinist faith. And consistent Christianity, I think, is the Christianity easiest to defend. Hence, I never call myself a fundamentalist. What I prefer to call myself is not a fundamentalist, but a Calvinist, that is, an adherent of the Reformed faith. As such, I regard myself as standing in the great central current of the church's life, the current that flows down from the Word of God through Augustine and Calvin and which has found noteworthy expression in America in the great tradition represented by Charles Hodge and Benjamin Breckenridge Warfield and the other representatives of the Princeton School. So, so Machen moved in a different conceptual world than most fundamentalist did of his day. When he took on modernism, he took it on as a challenge to reformed Christianity. And so his most important book, which uh, has just come back into print and gone out of print from uh, Erdman's, this is what you should all have in your library, this is as relevant today as it was 70 years ago in 1923 when it was written, 
The title, Liberalism and Christianity, says almost all the story, because he was not titling the book Liberalism and Fundamentalism. The challenge of liberalism was not a challenge to fundamentalism. It was a challenge to Christianity. It was a big, all-encompassing challenge. And so he, he wrote the blurb for the book like this. Liberalism on the one hand and the religion of, of the historic church on the other are not two varieties of the same religion, but two distinct religions proceeding from altogether separate Roots. He had one regret, and that is that he had not titled the book Christianity and Modernism, because he came to feel that in calling it liberalism, he gave it too much credit, because the word liberalism has a noble history, and what's unique about modernism is that it is modern, which is no compliment, nor indictment in itself. What was it? What was liberalism slash modernism? The words are used interchangeably in Machen. I'll use them interchangeably here. Here again, he moved not nearly so quickly as the fundamentalists into showing specific fundamental doctrines that modernists were moving away from. He didn't do it that way. He didn't jump quickly on the virgin birth and say, this is what we must talk about, or the resurrection, or the infallibility of scripture. His approach was far deeper and far broader as he engaged modernism in, in his day. What he did was engage in, first, a thorough analysis of the modern culture and the spirit of the age, and he tries to think through the relationship between modernism and what Os Guinness has been calling modernity. Modern culture is his word for it. They're not the same. Modernism is the theological construct and atmosphere theologically that is growing out of modernity. And Machen's first efforts are to get at what this thing is and then deal with it on its own terms. Let me read a quote about modern culture. He says, modern culture is a tremendous force. Modern inventions and the industrialism that has been built upon them have given us, in many respects, a new world to live in. He's writing 1920, 23. And these material conditions have been produced by mighty changes in the human mind. The industrial world of today has been produced not by blind forces of nature, but by conscious activity of the human spirit. It has been produced by the achievements of science. And then he observes, the problem for the church is that modernity has on the one hand bred forces that are inimical and hostile to Christian faith and created a world that the church loves to embrace and does embrace and must embrace. Quote, this is a skewering quote. This could be written yesterday if you just uh, replaced uh, railroad, telegraph, and printing press with computers, jets, and fax machines. We cannot, without inconsistency, employ the printing press, the railroad, the telegraph, computers, jets, fax machines. We cannot employ them in the propagation of our gospel and at the same time denounce as evil those activities of the human mind that produced these things. That, that is the fundamental problem that I think Oz has been wrestling with, the problem of modernity. Now what he says is that this calls for a critical assessment of modernity or contemporary culture. The negative impulses that are hostile to Christianity, he said, were, were three. One, suspicion of the past. And that's natural. <laughs> if you look around your life and you can remember the time when there were no cars, no refrigeration, no electric light, no telegraph, 
You can remember those days. You lived. Why, you would soon become pretty persuaded that the past doesn't have very much to offer. I mean, everything is in the future. It is a totally new world. It had been the same for 6,000 years, and in the last 50, it's a new world. So who needs the past? I mean, they rode chariots for 6,000 years. Now we've got cars. There's nothing it has to offer. So that, that, you can feel some of the force of that thinking. Secondly, skepticism about truth and the replacement of the category of true with useful. And you can feel some of that. When you do your experiments in order to find out how to make light, how to make refrigeration, how to make words go over wires, who gives a hoot about truth if it works? I mean, if you can fax, if you can work computers, I mean, does it work? And so you can feel some of the, the force why true, that category just kind of goes down and useful and efficient comes up. And the third is the denial of the supernatural. Is there any such thing? It hasn't been obvious in any of our recent discoveries, and we're, we, are, we are fixing the diseases. You don't need prayer anymore. You just, as Dr. Fuller says, you get the rats out of the manholes. Just poison the rats. Find a new chemical that'll kill the rats, and, and that'll take care of your black plague. Machen credits modernism, now that's the theological response to modernity. Machen credits modernism with really trying to come to terms with these challenges. Quote, what is the relationship between Christianity and modern culture? May Christianity be maintained in a scientific age? It is this problem which modern liberalism, modernism, attempts to solve. And in trying to solve it, liberalism or modernism has joined modernity in, one, minimizing the significance of the past, and two, accepting the utilitarian view of truth, and three, surrendering supernaturalism. And all three compromises with the spirit of modernity together produce the modernist spirit in religion. It is a spirit. It's, it's not a set of doctrines per se or a set of denials. This is why Machen, oh, this is so important, it's important today. This is why Machen never tired not only of criticizing the doctrinal views of people in the PCUSA, but what he called indifferentism or latitudinarianism. The President Stevenson, who was the president of, of Princeton in those days, did not want, he, he affirmed, he said, the whole Westminster Confession, but he did not want to push the liberals out. Machen never tired of saying that there's a spirit here of modernism that creates an atmosphere in which shifts away from orthodoxy happen and it's the spirit that minimizes truth as true and elevates truth as useful. 